Hi, I'm Paul Marcel. Well, today we're going to start building the entertainment center, so I want to show you the jigs involved with it that I used when I made the mock-up. So let's uh, go jump back in time and take a look and see how I did that. Whoa. So this is deja vu. Looks familiar. So what I'd like to do with this project is make a mock-up. What the mock-up is going to do is it's going to give me a chance to visualize it in actual 3D. I could even put it where it's going to be sitting. And at the same time, it's going to give me a chance to kind of prove that the jigs I've come up with for making this thing are actually going to work the way they are intended. And we'll actually go over some of the jigs here in just a moment. Now, when I originally conceived of this object, it was just, you know, napkin engineering. You just draw that on a cocktail napkin. And then afterwards, I came to drawing it full size on basically some packing paper. Now, I taped this up on my wall back in October, and, uh, well, around February, I removed it. Let me tell you, blue tape doesn't always come off very easy. But this full-size drawing gave me a chance to take a look at it and see, well, do I really like it? Is it the right width? Is it the right angles? Is it the right everything? And to me, this one actually looked really, really good. So I'm calling that version one of the drawing, and I did do part of the mock-up for version one, and that's sitting back here. Now, this is the top drawer section of version one, and uh, you know, it, as you can see, all the miter angles came out just absolutely gorgeous. I was really, really happy about that. But what I found is that when I looked at this you know, in the shop and also in the house where it's gonna be going, I'm looking at the facets and they're just not jumping out at me enough. Part of the point of the drawing was I wanted the facets to taper. So they taper down from a wider side. If you're looking at them face on, they go from wider down to narrower. But it's so subtle in version one that actually it almost looks like just a straight strip of wood, like you punted on it, and I really didn't like that. And from the front, it's just not jumping out at me. It almost looks like just an exaggerated rounded or chamfered corner. So I've come up with version two, and I'm going to be showing you the setup with version two. In version two, the facets are basically a little bit wider at the top, almost double in width, but the bottom is still the same width. So we're really going to be pulling that in so that you can very easily see that there's a taper but because you're viewing it on an angle it's a little bit more subtle it's been it's taking out the bite of that taper now how did I calculate these angles if you're a SketchUp user you could probably draw this out and maybe SketchUp gives you a way of looking at the boards on the flat so you can see what the miter angles are and then possibly even the bevel angles but uh, part of me I'm not really a big SketchUp user nothing against the product it's just not something I sit down and do I'd rather be monkeying with something in here than at the computer, which is why you're going to find my solution a little bit funny. What I did is I consulted the two neurons in my head that were in charge of remembering linear algebra from college, and I asked them, what do I do? And they said, reread the book. So I did. I reread the linear algebra book. Let me tell you, that was a boring night. But linear algebra actually held the key for solving this. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a math lesson at all. There is actually going to be an episode dedicated to just the math part of it. So if you're masochistic and you're really interested in the math, you can watch that. If not, you can just punt it to the curb, no problem. But what I did is I took a top projection of the cabinet as I anticipated it. So this is a top projection, the other one was a purely a frontal. Uh, what this did is it has a picture of the top scaled and of course the bottom scaled and then from that I could derive vectors that represent the edges. So I represented vectors for each one of these edges here. And with that I was able to calculate all the inclinations all the joints and the miters and the bevels that go along with it. And the way I did that is not with something like SketchUp, uh, as I just wrote my own program, because really the math is pretty easy. It's just that you know, when you're dealing with matrix math, you're dealing with a whole lot of individual calculations. So this is the output of my program. It gives me the eight compound angles here. So you got both a miter cut and a bevel set with it. Uh, there's a whole lot of extra output. Most of this output is things like, well, what's the length of this front face, what's the length of the top of this facet on the front, the facet that's in the back, those things. All those lengths are there for the top as well as on the bottom. So what I plan on doing is I'll mark the angles with this length and then I'll verify that that is correct by measuring the bottom and matching it up. That way there if I transpose a digit, I'll catch it. And also this makes it look like a really complicated project. So now I've got it calculated out to a thousandth of a degree. What am I going to do? I'm not going to really use some of these, you know, plastic protractor tools, kind of eyeballing where the thing is going to go in between there. 
that's going to just be way too much error. So part of the reason actually why this got delayed from, you know, I, I hung up the picture in October with the intention of starting on it in November was because the Angle Master Pro from Bridge City Toolworks was intended to ship in November, but it shipped actually in February. So that was the reason why I postponed the project. Now what this tool is, is it's a, it's a way of setting angles, and measuring angles, marking angles, whatever, with an extreme precision. This is actually accurate down to six thousandths of a degree. So though I calculate out to a thousandth, I can do the math to figure out how the setting is on here, and I can be within six thousandths of a degree. What I'm trying to do with this project is I'm trying to do the math and then establish the jigs that are going to do the cuts with as high of precision as I possibly can. I want to push the point where the error can be introduced, which is when I'm pushing the board through to do the final cut on the curly maple. If I can push the error out to the very last point, it's going to be saving me a whole bunch of sanding, and honestly, I have yet to find any caulk that's curly maple colored. So I do have a separate video that's going to be reviewing this and explaining how it gets used in a number of different situations, and then presenting some of the applications that you use it with. So take a look for that. I think you'll find it very interesting. All right, well, version two isn't going to build itself, so let's go head over to the jig. I'll explain how that goes, and let's get cutting this. So I need a repeatable way of cutting all these miters. The reason I say repeatable is that each one of these three drawer boxes has, you know, the eight compound cuts on one side, and the other is mirrored, but then those same angles are cut on all three. Now, normally when you're doing miter cuts, the first thing you think of is getting one of these fancy miter gauges that has, a, you know, the protractor with positive stops and maybe a little vernier down here for setting some finer angles, uh, but in all honesty, I've used this exclusively for 90 degrees, and if you take a look at the protractor, actually, it only goes down to a tenth of a degree. So to me, this is out. So the jig I came up with is basically a one-sided cross-cut sled. I say one-sided because it's only on the right side of the table saw blade, doesn't have a bridging unit to the other side, has just one track that's going to ride in the miter slot of the table saw. Now this is one of the nice incro ones, the ones that you can snug it up and it'll it'll fill all the slops. So there's no slop on this one. All I did is you know assemble it, stick half inch MDF on the track so that I could screw it into the slot. And then uh, there's a little something going on here, but basically I did a cut in order to show this is exactly where the blade is located. Then you know you glue in the fence on the bottom, dead 90 degrees to the cut and that's been you know, glued and screwed. Some of these other things that are on here are just you know, some hold downs and this is actually for a portion of the jig I'll be showing you in a moment. But what I did here on this edge is a little bit different than most crosscut sleds and this might be something that'll be useful for you. Typically when you're using a crosscut sled you stick the blade at 90 degrees and you do all of your cuts at 90 degrees. So you never have a worry of really chewing up your sled because the blade is being changed on the bevel. In this case, I have eight unique compound cuts, which means four unique bevels are being used, so I'll, I'll be chewing up the side of this crosscut sled quite a bit. So what I did is when I assembled it, I intentionally kept the main body of the sled about an inch away from the blade. And then I took a domino, I mortised some you know, mid-size mortises here, then I ripped a bunch of MDF, put some domino mortises in the right places, glued in some dominoes, and I just stuck it in here and attached it with some number six screws. Now to better explain why I did this, let's just think about a couple different cuts. If I had the blade at 90 degrees and I make the cut, you can see where the cut is. That's how I did this one. Now let's say I tilt it over 30 degrees. Well now I've got a gap between the edge of this sled and where the blade is going to be coming down on the underside. So I'm going to get some chip out, blow out, little tear out, that type of thing. Something to make it look ugly on the underside. Now, is it going to be significant enough that I care? I don't know, but I really don't want to make the cut and go, I should have done something to clean that up. So this was my solution. It's really, really fast to do. Now, I'm not going to be switching these out for each and every bevel cut. So as I make cuts where I have a steeper tilt and then I go up to a zero degree tilt, meaning straight up 90 degrees, each one of those times I make a change, I'm cutting a fresh edge. I'm still maintaining all the support on the bottom side. It's only when I go from a shallow tilt angle to a more exaggerated tilt angle do I have to swap the board to get full support. So you might find that useful if you end up doing a number of different types of bevel cuts and you want to have a, you know, a sled that will help support it the whole way through. Now I said that I glued this fence in, so how the heck am I going to make a miter cut like this? I didn't want to have something like, say, the miter gauge where I would have to readjust it in between cuts. So if I have a mirrored cut, I didn't want to have to recalibrate or, or change the protractor to flip it to the other side, you know, to go from making a cut like this to making a cut like this. I wanted to keep it the same, and I want it to be repeatable, and also a little bit fast would be nice too. 
So what I did is I created a series of triangles. Now these are the triangles from version one, so we're gonna be making the ones for version two here in a moment. But basically the idea is you place it on here. I added this extra screw here so that I could basically lock these in place. And then you can place the board right on the sled. And that's the miter angle that it's gonna cut. Now when you need to cut the other one like this, just unscrew this, flip it over, and you've got it. It's very nice and fast to do. And the best part about it is that it's repeatable. I can go through all of these and I'm always going to get the same exact angle. So if I have a minor error in this triangle, at least it's going to be consistent. All the cuts are going to have the same error. So that's how this sled works. Very, very easy idea. So now the question becomes, how am I going to create all these triangles? And how am I going to get them to be as accurate as I've been wanting to get these things? So the way I'm going to cut these triangles is I marked them all out on some MDF here. So just some simple half inch MDF. I took the angle master, knowing the angle that I needed, I could just set, you know, let me just set a random angle, then put the hook over the edge of the board, and then I could scribe the line. Now, it's not quite long enough for doing the drawing, so since it's a magnetized edge, I could very easily snap a ruler on there, and I would just mark the line. So that's how I did it. I marked all the angles, and then in between the triangles, I just used a square to mark the square cut that we're going to need. Now, to do the cut, I'm just going to use the TS-75 on the MFT, and I'm going to use the guide rail. The edge of the guide rail has been cut to the side of the saw, so it's exactly where the blade is going to cut. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to put the board underneath and just eyeball it. So that's how I'm going to do it. I did that for version one, and there were only two corrections. So uh, we'll see how good I get on uh, try number two. do now is take all these triangles that I've cut and I was you know eyeballing these and go back and verify all the angles are correct to make any co corrections that I need now correction doesn't mean going back and resawing them I'm hoping that these are going to be so close that I can simply shim them and that's what I want to do here now I got all fancy schmancy and I you know wrote down all the angles for the miter cuts as well as the bevel that goes along with it and which part of this top is being cut with it. Now for the angles, I wrote both the caliper number for the tilt, that being how far this has to go to touch this, but I also wrote the caliper number for the complement, the 90 degree complement. So I can put this down here and I'll know the number to get it down to there. Now I did that calculation so that I can make this validation a little bit faster and easier for me. So the way that I'm gonna do this, let's just take a look at this one. It needs to have 138.4 millimeters is to get to the complement. So I can leave it square on the table here so we'll zero it, and then I'm going to tilt down the arm until it goes beyond 138 on the caliper reading. There we go, we're at 140 on the caliper. Now I'm simply going to take this triangle, and I'm going to be sliding it in until I see no light on the very tip of it here. I want when this tip touches this bar, that's when I'm going to stop and take a reading. And I got 138.28. So I have 138.4 is what I was looking for. So this is too short. In a way this hypotenuse is too short. So what I need to do is I need to extend it. I need to make this angle more shallow. To make this angle more shallow I would need to lift the front up. So I'll be applying little shims of tape here. Now if for some reason this angle was not quite enough I could apply tape here to raise it up. So I'll apply a, a piece of tape here on the front and we'll see how that goes. Burnish it in, because you don't want it compressing later. There we go. I added a third piece of tape, and now we're at 138.39. So, if I'm within what I was shooting to do, and what I did on version 1 was to shoot to being within two hundredths of a millimeter, which works out to about about a hundredth of a degree, depending on where you are on the caliper. And uh, it worked out great, so that's the target I'm shooting for now. So this one here is done, took three pieces of little tape. So now I'm happy that these are as accurate as I need them for this cut, and basically the error now is going to be me pushing that board through the table saw. Now that I have a working jig, and it just worked out great when I made mock-up version 1 and on version 2, both I mean, all the angles just came out beautifully, everything matched up. And now I feel like I can commit to doing it on the curly maple, and I'm liking the design too, so this would be the chance to go and make some changes. So in our next episode, we're going to take this 
pile of curly maple, get it out of the garage, out onto the driveway, and start sorting the boards, figure out which ones are going to go where. We've done stock dimensioning a number of times in different podcasts, so I'm not really going to spend too much time. Although there are a few changes in the way that we want to do the dimensioning due to the fact that this thing is all built on inclines. So some of the ways that we cut out drawer parts is going to be a little bit different. And it actually comes all the way back to where we get to the stock dimensioning. So those type of changes we'll put in the episode and we'll get this thing to the point where we can have a dry assembly of at least those drawer boxes. And then from there, we'll build the rest out. So hope you'll follow along. Thanks. <laughs>